The Unshackled Waves, episode 31. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode. It's been another week of high drama and scandal, both in the news itself and also in the media, so there are plenty of talking points. I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukith Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Steve, and hello, everyone. Late last week, we saw President Trump give his first press conference as president, where he addressed the resignation of his national security advisor, Michael Flynn, and attacked the media for uh, their inaccurate portrayal of his administration as being in a a state of uh, constant chaos. The media were shocked that a president would attack them in this way, but of course, a president has the right to attack the media. We also saw another major scandal involving one of the alternative media's most high-profile public figures, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, after two podcasts surfaced of him appearing to condone uh, or downplay pedophilia. Of course, both the left and the right have been looking to tear Milo down for a long time by any means possible. As a result, he has uh, been disinvited from speaking at this year's Conservative Political Action Conference. He's lost his uh, book deal with Simon & Sucher and has just resigned from Breitbart. So there's plenty to talk about in regards to that. Uh, Back here in Australia, we had yet another left-wing program uh, introduced by the Victorian government. Uh, This time it's a a series of anti-racism measures designed to counter the alleged rise of the far right in the state. Never mind about the state's uh, rising crime, it's supposed racism which is the real threat to public safety. And also, (laughs) yet again, we have these so-called experts in Australia pushing another nanny state policy, this time a sugar tax as a way for the government to force us to take uh, better care of ourselves. So we'll start now by talking about uh, Trump versus the media, which is he had he had the press conference because last week, and we mentioned this on uh, last week's podcast, there there was the, yeah the resignation of his national security advisor over uh, misleading the vice president about his uh, uh, talking uh, discussion with the Russian ambassador, and then there was also another story alleging that the Trump campaign had been talking with uh, Russian in intelligence. So tr- uh, so Trump at the pre- at the press conference he, he really like laid into the media saying no you're you know, creating, saying that my administration's in a in a state of chaos and uh, this it's totally dysfunctional. Yet, uh, you know, it's it's working working quite quite well for me. And the media was like, oh, you know, he's just having a you know complain and whinging about the media coverage. Like, how, how pathetic uh, is that and petty? But I, I think he had a right to do that because if you viewed CNN or any of the other uh, mainstream press, you you would think that. Oh, this is the most dysfunctional administration ever. Yeah, you would, because CNN and all those left-wing mainstream media organizations, they keep misrepresenting their own president. Um, you know, they keep giving in. Well, they, they are the source of the entire left-wing um, outrage we are seeing today. They keep supporting it. They keep, you know, um, endorsing the, the, the riots. It's free speech, apparently. It's... the. Trump's presidency is not dysfunctional. Yes, someone resigned. Well, that always happens. That doesn't mean it's dysfunctional. Okay, um, I suppose it, it's it's different. It's it's one thing to say that he has threats from the I suppose the deep state, and it's something else to say that he's you know his presidency is dysfunctional simply because um, someone resigned from from, uh, from 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 the White House. And I think that's just that just goes to show that you know the media has doesn't really have any faith towards Trump, which its its main goal seems to be. It's, it's confirmed that his main goal is to take him down in any way possible. Yeah, uh, let's have a look why 
it appears that his administration is dysfunctional. This is because he is trying to implement what he said he would do during during the campaign, which is, and we talked about the, the deep state last week and how they're trying to uh, thwart Trump's policy agenda. So, of course, you know, we all knew that implementing his agenda wasn't going to be easy. So the media is basically saying, oh, because you're doing what you said you were going to do, and there's people opposed to that, oh, it's, it's dysfunction. I mean... Uh, th that's just totally totally ridiculous. I mean, of course there was going to be this pushback by the bureaucracy and the intelligence agencies, but that's not a problem with Trump. That's a problem with the uh, with the deep state. It is, yeah. And I think we need to uh, we need to remember that many people um, didn't really think he was being serious when he said he was going to do this and that. They were, they were just like, okay, he won. Um, it doesn't mean he's serious. You know, it doesn't mean he's going to do all of it. But then he starts to actually do what he's going to say. You know, for, for um, which is which is very which is like the first we've seen in an actual president. You know, doing everything he said he would do. Um, and that's how the media got triggered by everything because they weren't expecting. It. They thought he was just using it to get votes. And they were like, okay, you know, it's going to be bad. It's going to. It's not going to be that bad. You know, he, he was just. He was just trying to appeal to people. Well, the thing is, he. He was. He actually did what he was going to say, and that triggered the media. And now, um, they can't handle that. They can't handle the fact that he's doing what he's going to do, and they're blaming all his executive orders. You know, saying he's signing all these executive orders. He's doing all that. Yeah. Well, you weren't complaining about that when Obama was bombing hospitals, but you know, it just shows that the media is. It just shows that the media is a real person who's dysfunctional right now, not President Trump. Yeah, and. I mentioned this before, the fact that, oh, you know, oh, he's criticizing the media. That's a, that's a threat to the First Amendment. No, it's not. I mean, he's allowed to you know, criticize the media. The First Amendment, yes, it uh, allows for a free press, but it doesn't say that the, uh, the media is, is free, free from criticism. But, like, Trump, like, if he was going to, like, say, pass laws restricting the press, then, then that would be a different thing. But the president's allowed to say, I think, you know, CNN, CNN is fake news. Uh, he, he's, he's allowed to do that. I mean, the media, you know, they, they should, like, they spend their time criticising other people. They, they shouldn't get so triggered when, when they get criticised. They shouldn't. It's his right to criticize the media, and for good reason. Look at what the media is doing. Half the country are disillusioned by the media. The only reason the media is getting all these views is because, you know, many Trump supporters are just, they, they, they find it entertaining to see how the leftist media shills for Hillary. They find it entertaining how to see how the leftist media is getting triggered by everything that has anything to do with Trump. That's the only reason they're getting all those views. You know, they, they're saying, you know, we have all these views. CNN, you know, we're popular. Well, the only reason you're popular is because half the country watches you, or well, half of your viewers are watching you because they feel entertained by the fact that you're triggered. You know, we could stop watching CNN, and that would mean you would lose most or half of your viewers. That's that's simply what it would mean. So, you know, you're not... you. They're really nothing, really, because most people are disillusioned by them. They don't trust them because they're liars, and that's what they do, and that's what they're good at. It's the mainstream media. What do you ex what do you expect? And of course, Trump sent out a tweet saying that uh, the major media outlets are enemies of the American people. And uh, John McCain, who who hates Trump, said that, "Oh, this is how you know dictators behave." Like saying, "Oh, oh, oh I'm not saying that Trump's a dictator, but oh, this is how you know di uh, dictators behave." What well, if the if the media is doing a disservice to the American people, the the president has the has the right to say so. Yeah, the president was voted in by the people. Of course, he has the right to say, you know, the media is misleading people, the media is lying to people. Yes, the media is probably the biggest threat there is to the people because the media keeps, you know, trying to promote the left-wing agenda and ruin the country and, you know, along with that, ruin the, ruin the world. And Donald Trump, what he's doing is he's trying to make sure that he can do everything so that people can actually, um, you know, bypass the media, so that people can actually ignore the media and, you know, sort of listen to the truth. That's why his tweets are very effective because the thing is, his tweets, he, m many people lo love his tweets. Even many um, people who don't necessarily support him, they like the fact that he tweets because the thing is, he um, is able to directly tell people what he's going to do so that people don't have to rely on the lying mainstream media to get their information.
Yeah, that's that's what the the media so hates about uh, Trump and his administration, the fact that he is rendering them irrelevant. I mean, all this all, all this like hysteria about oh, the free press is being attacked. No, you're just losing your influence. Like losing your influence that doesn't mean you're being suppressed. Like that's just the market at work. Yeah, exactly. That's the market at work, you know. People, just the fact that you brought it upon yourself, you brought all of this upon yourself. You know, you lied to the people, you shielded for Hillary, and now half the country hates you. That's how it is. Live with it. You know, you're complaining. The fact that you keep complaining shows that you haven't learned your lesson, and that just means it'll re result in your own downfall. Um, which I suppose will be good for society because that's what we need to see. We need to see that we need to see the downfall of media that lies to people and tries to um, foster some sort of, um, you know, negative public opinion that is, isn't justified. Yeah, and when you keep reporting on fake news, I mean, this week it was the, oh, that uh, members of the Trump ca uh, Trump campaign had had communicated with members of the Russian intel intelligence community and that, you know, all these support, uh, people in his inner circle have links with Russia. Like, if you, if you, report like constantly fake news then you know you should be held accountable for that i mean uh, a free press doesn't it doesn't mean that you know you you have you have the right to spread lies yeah it doesn't mean and you know, if you do spread lies then you know you will receive the backlash and if you're responsible you would you will learn to accept it because you know um the thing is if hillary was president right now i'm pretty sure your reaction will be your, your reaction your everything will be much different to how Trump is president right now, you know, you wouldn't care about the fact that she's done all those evil things. You wouldn't care about the fact that she would continue to do all those evil things if she was elected. Um, and that just shows what they really are. And the mainstream press, they now hate the term fake news. I mean, we saw Don Lemon get triggered by, stop using that term fake news. It's like, you yeah. created it. You're the ones who's, who created this term fake news, and you don't like the fact that it's now being used against you. Yeah. See, the that the thing is, I sometimes pity them because that just shows that, you know, they they have a very short term level of thinking, you know, they, they invent the word fake news, they label all these alternative media outlets as fake news, they label Fox News as fake news, and, you know, next minute, you know, everyone else is proving how they are the fake news. So they're, they're making memes, they're, showing, they're comparing the same authors who write completely different, you know, headlines, you know, um, one that says um, the Electoral College is, is great, then the same author a few days later says the Electoral College is sexist and should we, we should get rid of it. You know, people have begun to use your own argument against you because the thing is people have proof to use your own argument against you. They've used everything you've done, all the lies you've said, they've used it against you and now you've become the fake news. Even leftists, many leftists agree with that as well. And, you know, now you hate it. Well, tough luck, tough luck. Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, I've also seen leftists now, they want us to use stop uh, stop using the term triggered. Well, you're the ones who created the term triggered and trigger <laughs> yeah. warnings. And so you're saying, oh, stop using that word. Well, it's your own invention. It's your legacy. We are just, you know, we are... We are just keeping up your legacy. You made those words up. You know, you were the one to uh, um, admitting that you would be triggered by these the, this particular video, and therefore you would have to, um, you know, put the word trigger warning before you actually post it. And now using that, we 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 do the same thing. Isn't that what you wanted? Yeah, and uh, Trump this week he's he's still holding uh, rallies around the around the nation to thank his supporters and continue uh, the relationship with his supporters. And this week uh, on the weekend there was one in uh, Melbourne, Florida, uh, where he said he wanted to communicate with uh, with his supporters without the filter of the mainstream press. And he ta and he talked about. Uh, 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 immigration and then the problems in Europe and said uh, yeah. uh, you saw last night what happened in uh, what's happening in Sweden and of course the mainstream press saw, oh, thought he was referring to a terrorist attack in Sweden so they're like oh there were and like reported these Swedish officials saying what we, we didn't know there was uh, no any, any terrorist attack in Sweden what's he talking about and the mainstream media was like oh he's reported you know uh, made some made something up oh he you know he's spreading lies and oh look he's he's unhinged but anyone who uh, who was in Trump's uh, inner circle or support base knew that he was talking about uh, a TV interview 
on uh, Tucker Carlson tonight, which is for Trump supporters, is much watched TV on uh, F Fox News, where uh, he interviewed a Swedish uh, uh, so, uh, a documentary maker who made a f film about uh, the rape and crime epidemic in in Sweden. And so Trump was saying you saw it was saying you saw what's happening in Sweden last night. He was referring to that show because he assumed that most people uh, in the audience had at least seen that interview or heard of it. Uh, so this was another misrepresentation of, of what, Trump, uh, what Trump had said. Yeah, I mean, he was, the thing, the thing is, he was talking to his supporters and they knew what was going on. But I think he should have, um, you know, just, just, you know, realized that, you know, the media will, will be watching anyway. Um, so, you know, I think he should have done that. But yes, again, another example of, the, of how the media twists everything, manipulates everything. Sweden, the thing is, the thing is, Trump is smart, he's clever, because now everybody, everybody is researching what's happening in Sweden. You know, Trump was like, last night, Sweden, everyone's like, what? You know, all the, the officials, the mainstream media, they were all like, he's lying, terrorist, and what happened next? Everyone is starting to research what's happening in Sweden, you know, and we all know what's happening in Sweden. Sweden's practically gone. You know, you can't, it's, it's gone. You know, we, we need to save the European countries um, that are left in cause Sweden. I think it's finished, but uh, everyone's researching what's happening there. And, you know, that's clever because now everyone sort of knows what's happening. Or, well, many leftists, I suppose, they might know, but they're, they're in denial, obviously. But, you know, people have been exposed and that's what's important. And I think that's one of the many talents Trump has. He's able to sort of use his words and um, sort of um, air his words in a particular way to make sure that people somehow expose themselves to what's really happening in the world. As I said, you know, he was, he told them, he, he mentioned Sweden and now everybody is outraged because apparently he's lying and now everyone is researching what's happening in Sweden. So I think it's very commendable that he did that. Well, the media are also triggered because he attacked uh, uh, their socialist uh, paradise of Sweden. Yeah. I mean, uh, they, in the presidential campaign, like Bernie Sanders saying, look how good Sweden is. But of course, you know, uh, us who've been following the, the migrant crisis in Europe know that Sweden is, is one of the worst countries. And uh, even though the Swedish government tries to suppress uh, stories of migrant crime, a lot of it's filtered through to the Western media with a lot of Swedish people speaking to Western media about uh, what, uh, what's what's going on. So it's, uh, they, they can say that, oh, you know, nothing to see here, oh, Trump's, uh, tr uh, there was no terrorist attack in, in Sweden, but, uh, you know, that if, obviously Trump wasn't saying that, but of course, they have now people are looking at what's really going on in Sweden, and of course, uh, they they obviously were trying to trying to say to people, oh, nothing nothing to see here about Sweden, but but now the cat cat's out of the bag, and now uh, thanks to Trump, people people are aware of what what's really going on in Sweden, then finally exposed to the truth. Yeah, as I said, that's one of his many talents, and the thing is with Sweden again, um, yes, people are you know just always you know talking about sweden and saying how it's such a paradise well it's not because and that has you know even if there was no migration sweden would have been bad why because the un predict the un now predicts that sweden will become a third world country in a few years um you know that's that's what happens when you live in a socialist utopia you know you become a third world country um one of the best countries in the world um and now it's 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 gone and you know, that just shows that you know the media doesn't really want to tell the truth because it just shows that the media doesn't even care about the result. You know, all they want is that left, all they want is a left-wing agenda to be promoted as much as possible. They don't care about the truth. You know, they're probably doing it for the money. Um, and again, it's their downfall because people don't listen to them anymore. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll move on to oh, this week's second controversy, which is, yeah. of course, Marle Yiannopoulos' uh, pedophilia controversy. So yeah. where, where did all this come from? So there were two podcasts that he did. One was the uh, Joe Rogan experience, where he talked about how he, uh, when he was 14, had sex with uh, a Catholic priest, or as he called him, Father Michael, and he... he 
he talked he talked about it in like glowing terms saying um uh, forgive my language that oh you know i wouldn't have give given as good a head if it wasn't for father michael so sort of even though miley didn't say it himself he was a victim of like child um se sexual abuse and often uh what happens to two victims is they try to like ras rationalize it because they don't mm. want to be seen as as victims because yeah. that invokes trauma so you, you can sort of understand like why he said something like that as a, as a victim because you know he he doesn't sort of want to sort of you know admit that you know this was something horrible yeah um yeah you know we understand i i think that the thing about father michael he was joking about that i think we can all we can we can all we all know he was joking about that you know we know um that he didn't really mean that you know he was just trying to sort of he, he said you know he was using he was using his british sarcasm and his british humor um to sort of talk it down and you know just joke about it that's that, that's okay i suppose um if it was just a joke but you know it's just um uh, I think he, sometimes he, he wasn't trying to uh, downplay the significance of uh, you know tra child sexual abuse by yeah. by priests. I mean, his experience is obviously different from heaps of other people's experience. Yeah, I don't think he was trying to downplay the experience by you know with priests. Um, I, we will get to that whole other thing later on. But I just want to say that you know. Uh, if you're a victim of it, well, you know, that's very unfortunate. I, I know that. But, you know, you can't just sort of hide behind some sort of, um, you know, false charade and just, you know, just act like it was nothing. You know, it was something and it was bad. And yeah, he, he, he was trying to act, act tough, like, you know, yeah. oh, you know, I wasn't affected by it, I think, because... I think the last thing somebody like Miley wants to do is, uh, is demonstrate vulnerabilities. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think because he's he's a troll, and a troll can't demonstrate vulnerabilities because that just means he loses image. Um, but you know, I think the important thing isn't about the Father Michael thing. I think the important thing is what he said about pedophilia afterwards and the yes, reaction to yes. it. So this yeah. was the other podcast, which was with the drunken peasants who um, are, are sort of well, they're YouTubers slash podcasters. So he he was he was talking about uh, they, they was talking about the age of consent and. Uh, Milo at the beginning said that he thinks the age of consent, which in the UK is 16, is about right. But uh, there, then he mentioned that um, uh, people who are younger than that do have uh, sexual experiences. And uh, he was talking about how uh, from the ages of 13 and above, that's not pedophilia, it's uh, 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 hebophilia and ebophilia so it appeared like he was downplaying uh, uh he, he was downplaying uh, se sexual abuse of teenagers i think he it well it, it appeared i think he was not downplaying i think he was it looked like he was advocating for it to be honest because yeah oh, well, we'll, we'll move on to what he said after that he is he defended what is called pedestry which is uh, older men having uh sexual relations with younger boys and it's 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 sort of it, i guess to explain it to people it's it's sort of it's it's when an older man uh, not only it's not just when an older man plays a father figure to a younger boy but also like you know uh ha uh has sexual relations with them so it, it's it, it's 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 not like a simple you know father figure thing it's sort of a yeah very grooming uh you know uh taking advantage of a younger younger boy it is i mean uh... It's bad. It was Milo sounded very Sparta, didn't he? Um, because he, I think we need to. This is a good situation where the the divide within the right plays an important role because we know that even in the right, there's the the blue section. Uh, well, visually, there's the blue section and there's the purple section. And I think Milo is well inside the purple section. And for someone in the purple section, uh, you know, I think what he said um, wasn't that bad. Well, for someone in the blue section, the you know the actual conservative. Smiley is more of a libertarian. Let's face it, he's not a conservative. Well, he's not um, a conventional conservative. I mean, he, he just did an interview with uh, Bill Maher on his uh, HBO show Real Time, and he said that he wasn't a conservative. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's 
Yeah, he yeah, it's weird because he doesn't yeah he he doesn't call himself a conservative or an alt right person. He's more of a uh, cultural libertarian. That's probably the best. Yeah, he's libertarian. He's you know he's libertarian through and through. He's not conservative. And the thing is, the backlash is not coming from the people in that blue section. The original conservatives, the original right. Um, in the more authoritarian right, and of course the left. Now the left is mocking him, and you know, he's like, oh, you know, you, you look look at him, you know, a pedophile, etc. You know, advocating for pedophilia. I, I, however, I think um, we did see the me media frenzy again, as usual. However, it saddens me to say that I think this time the media frenzy is justified this time, um, because what he said was, I'm going to be honest, it was, it, it was triggering. It was. Um, I, I heard his video. I know he said the 16 year. Um, he said that 16 years should be um, is about right. That the um, the age of consent. I think that's low, and I know many people in the blue section would agree with me. Well, that's what um, we have in uh, Australia. Well, we do, and that's low. And George Christensen said the same thing. You know, it's low. It's it's low, um, and Christensen and the, yeah. I'll try to be, I don't want to be politically correct right here, here right now, um, but yes, it's too low and what he said was ghastly. I'm sorry, that's what, I, I, I watched the video, I understand he later on came out saying, you know, I, I was, you know, sexually abused at 13, that, that's sad, I get that, but he was saying all this stuff about it and I, I, the video, his excuses weren't consistent with what he said, you know, he's, you know the video had everything he said, you know, um, it wasn't cut off, it was, say, it was, one segment of the video, and he, he said everything um, that the media was talking about. You know, the media usually lies about all this stuff, manipulates, twists. With Trump, they twist everything. This time, the media was using exactly what he was saying in the video. Um, and what he said in the video was quite ghastly, really, because he, you know, he was talking about older men. He was saying it was nice for older men to give security and protection to younger men. No, you have parents for that. That's why you have parents. You don't need really an older man for that, any, uh, unless you're in Sparta or something. In his uh, 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 press conference, which just happened uh, overnight Australian time, he said that when, when he was talking about pedestry, he wasn't talking about like younger boys, as in like 13-year-old boys. He was he was referring to like 16, 17-year-olds, uh, and he he justified it by saying the term like boy means something different in the gay community. Like they still refer to like uh, men in their late teens as boys. So sort of saying I wasn't like talking about like really young teenagers. But the thing is, I think this demonstrates, and, and I've said this to libertarians uh, over many years that discussing like the age of consent is just not an area to talk about because there's, there's always this discussion like libertarian like especially the the libertines and the left libertarians say oh I've, you know having an arbitrary like age of consent or oh, is is not good but it's like it's just a totally unproductive discussion like i've always said what we have is about right let's just not talk about it because people are going to uh, are going to believe that you're trying to justify pedophilia which is not a product like that's not the way to like sell people on libertarianism that you know oh you know more more young people should have sex yeah you know when we do when well i mean I'm, i don't want to lower it i'm t saying we need to make it higher so you know, i'm not saying you know yeah you know well you know what i'm saying we need to make it higher um i do get the whole with the with the rhetoric with the boys um yes even back then boy means something else but you know it's, I know there's the whole hemophilia thing, and you know he was saying he was talking about boys in the later teens, or rather in the mid-teens. Um, but he said what he said. You know, he said what he said. He you know, at the end he said, you know, you know, I'm in prepubescent boys, and he said it's, it's bad. He said it's bad if it's prepubescent, and he said that's 13 years old. He said it's okay. Well, he implied it's okay if it's after that. He said it's bad only if it's prepubescent and that's he, he specified that as 13 years old um even if he said 15 years old i wouldn't agree with him even if he said 17 years old i i wouldn't agree with him okay i, I would i i would um criticize him a lot um and you know yeah. it's just yeah i think it just goes to, goes to show that he sort of keep it down sometimes and he was telling he was going too far he was going too far in some tangent you know he was just going off and off and off about it i think he should have controlled what he was going to say and just not said it at all at least because 
I do. I I I I am grateful for Milo, um, from for trying to promote our side of politics because the thing is because he was a gay man, people were people in the left were able to sort of um listen to him more. They were more willing to listen to him more because since he was a gay man, um, if it was a straight white hetero cis male, they wouldn't be very willing to listen to someone with the same views. But since he was gay, he was able to reach out better to the left. So I am grateful. And that's why I feel I am very disappointed with this turn of events. Yeah, and yeah, he ju- uh, they, it, it was just a topic not worth discussing. Like, I, I hope that we don't get into trouble for d- discussing what he was discussing. I mean, because it's such a um, a, d- a dangerous subject to to talk about, and that's why I j- just I think it's uh, my position always is what we have now is fine. There is no pr- no productive nothing productive to be gained by by talking about it. Uh, now let's talk about the consequences of this. And he's he's not just an attack being from because the traditional conservatives, uh, like such as the people in in National Review, this uh, story was first reported by the Blaze, which is Glenn Beck's uh, we- uh, website, and he's he's been a never Trump person and has expressed on his radio show his dislike for for Milo. So. Uh, it, yeah, it was uh, orchestrated by the uh, by the traditional right, who who nev- never liked him, don't don't like the alt right, and of course want this as an excuse to bring him down. And of course, the left, uh, of course, hate him, and of course uh, are using using this as as a way to drag him down. I mean, many on the left have like advocated uh, pedophilia. Um, like for like uh, the the most obvious example is salon.com with their resident pedophile uh, Todd Nickerson which is uh, they uh, salon they deleted all references to Todd Nickerson from their from their website so they could have a go at Milo uh, and if you watch like Todd Nickerson's videos like I'm not going to even describe them here they're totally disgusting like yeah. <laughs> uh, have you seen them <laughs> Um, I don't. I haven't. I don't think I should. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, just, just take my word for it. They like they are they are full on disgusting. Like that guy. Yeah. Is, that guy is a total creep. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. But but it's just interesting that now the the left they're suddenly against uh, pedophilia. Like because it's uh, and this is this is why I'm critical of the left's criticism of him uh, because. You know, are, are you uh, just outra- Are you genuinely outraged about what Milo said, or are you just using this as an excuse to drag him down by any means necessary? Yeah. Well, firstly, let me say that you know we we, we are criticizing it, obviously. Yeah. Um. Second, le- um. Oh, the I thing wasn't is- referring to you, obviously. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we as in us two are criticizing, obviously. Um. The thing is, uh. The me- yes, I can. I do agree with that. You know, we do have all these leftists who are advo- who are actually explicitly advocating for it. You know, on Tumblr we see all these people um doing doing it, and that's hor- horrifying. And you know, just degeneracy, infinite degeneracy to the infinite um amount. But the thing is, I I can, as I said, the media frenzy I think is justified, except for one thing, the. The particular thing I'm talking about is that the media is so silent when it comes to things like Islam, when it comes to things like they stand up for Islam. You know, we, the founder of that religion had did did it, you know, with with a child. OK, the founder of the religion and they have the nerve to um, defend him, defend that religion and put down anyone who criticizes that, that religion for its pedophilic roots. But now they're, you know, speaking against Mara. That's the that's the only thing I can find um, with the media that I feel is very, or with the mainstream media that I feel is very, um, you know, is ironic and hypocritical. But again, as I said, in general, I think that I do agree with the mainstream media frenzy this time. It's the only time I've agreed with a mainstream media frenzy, and it's now. Yeah, let's have a look at like the numerous examples of the left like justifying pedophilia. I mean, Lena Dunham like talked about in her book that uh, she touched a younger sister. Uh, all the uh, celebrities they they they, they, they all. Uh, they, uh, they all, you know, uh, adore the work of Roman Polanski, who is actually a convicted uh, child rapist. Yeah. Oh yes, we saw Meryl Streep um, applauding. For another, can we... and, and even though, like, I've, 
you know, don't don't mind Richard Dawkins. He once, you know, downplayed, um, you know, children having relations with adults. Well, you can now downplay it. Um, it's bad, no matter what. It's immoral, and yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, that's all I can say. Yeah, so uh, so, so it's obviously that you know, uh, there's there's a lot of people who are criticizing Milo who haven't got their 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 ha their hands completely clean. Um, yeah. But uh, so so what's happened with Milo? Yeah, so he's been disinvited to speak at the Conservative Political Action Conference. The, uh, that that announcement lasted for a whole day. That was the day before this story broke. Uh, he's lost his book deal with Simon and uh, Schuster. But um, he said in his press conference uh, that he's had a few interests from other publishers. So I think the, the book still will, uh, will, will be published. There'll be someone who will, will want to publish it. And uh, he's resigned from Breitbart um, as uh, we don't know whether he was forced to or whether that, uh, that's a decision on his own. We, we might never know. Uh, there were reports that staff from Breitbart threatened to walk out unless he was sacked. But... They're just uh, reports. So uh, he did an apology video and, as I mentioned, a, a press conference. He announced that he'll be starting his his own media website and being pretty much a freelancer from now on, which he doesn't need, need Breitbart um, anymore. I've sort of wondered the past few days whether he will survive this, and I think he will because he's he, he's get, he's got enough support, like people who are still saying they're, they're sticking by him. So I think he, he, he can survive. And there's yeah, there's a lot of like mainstream people still sticking by him, such as Infowars and the Daily Caller. Uh, and I've I've seen on Facebook quite a few people defending him. Yeah. Um, firstly, I don't see why anyone would stick by him. Um, as I said, we don't know, we don't know what I think. I don't, I don't see why anyone would. Um, I think he will survive, though. I do I do know that because um, as I said, many people in that purple quadrant are still on his side um, because, you know, it's just as for the, as for the result, I think we need, to, we need to ignore the left um, and what they're saying because, you know, we all know the shenanigans, um, the hypocrites. I think this issue is mainly between that the authoritarian right and the libertarian right. Um, and yes, the, the authoritarian right has always, um, they've never really liked him. You know, I, for example, I haven't always um, personally liked him. I thought he was useful um, because I thought, as I said, he could reach out to those leftists by, because he was gay and they were, I think they were more willing to listen to him. Um, but yeah, you know, he was considered to be a bit of a deviant as all, all by, by the authoritarian right. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, I think uh, he will survive because of the purple um, people, the people in the libertarian right. And uh, I don't know, again, um, I don't, I was surprised to see that he, he, did, he had many supporters in the first place after this revelation. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. You know. uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, he's done an incredibly uh, stupid thing, uh, you know, saying this. I mean, it's a, it's a really big uh, error of judgment. But let's, uh, uh, let's also keep it in perspective that, you know, he, he's only said this, like he hasn't been an abuser of, uh, you know, young teenagers himself. So you know he hasn't committed any crimes. So, yeah, he hasn't. Uh, he hasn't yeah. done. He hasn't done anything. But so, so, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so I think he, uh, like he, can, uh, his image can be rehabilitated. Like I, I don't. I haven't forgiven him as yet. Like uh, my whole position during this this scandal has just been to sort of see see what unfolds, see see what he says. But yeah, let's just see how how he he recovers from this and I'll, yeah and, and i'll reserve my judgment for for what happens in the weeks and months to come yeah as for me you know i do have to say admit that you know he's lost my support um i think i watched the video and i heard what he said i know what he said and i he's lost my support i think although i again he can be quite useful but i i just you know no more you know no association with him at all okay <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'll yeah we'll we'll see. There's still a lot to unfold uh, with this. So we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's talk about uh, less controversial matters. Yes. Um, oh, less controversial <laughs> uh, by comparison. Um, yeah. Uh, a, sh a sugar tax. 
Uh, yeah. So, so this was, um, I'll let you talk about it, Sukith, because you've just published an article on it. Yes, I did. And well, we have seen talk of a sugar tax since for a very long time. We have seen it. Um, and, you know, it's it was um, sort of pushed back because the mainstream politicians are against it for good reason. And um, but it's back again. You know, we had Pauline Hanson and Darren Hinch, who are Australian senators, um, and they uh, they said they criticized it both. They, they disagree on many things, but both of them together criticized the sugar tax as you know, unfair. It's unfair to the people who um, do have the constitution to live by a healthy lifestyle. And of course, they said it, it hurts the poor. And they said there are better ways to promote um, a healthy lifestyle by, for example, making sports expenses tax deductible, um, which will encourage people encourage parents to place their kids more in sporting activities, um, which I think is a better alternative than a sugar tax, because we have seen a sugar tax is regressive, it's ineffective, it doesn't achieve what it wants to do, and it, it ends up making things worse. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll hurt the poor, first of all, and it also uh, is, is a, a complete, uh, another nanny state proposal, which is taking away personal responsibility for, from people. That, like, this is another example of the, the so-called, you know, experts uh, uh, saying that people are too stupid uh, to look after themselves, so they need uh, big government to, to make sure that they look after their, their health. So, so it's, it's, it's another example of paternalism. And yeah, it's uh, like I said, it, it hits the people who can least afford it most because uh, the, the thing, the reason why uh, a lot of people consume a lot of sugar and uh, I should also add fatty foods is because they're, they're so cheap as well. Uh, and so it, to make making them more expensive is, is just going to, is just going to uh, lead to more people in poverty. It will, as studies have shown that, because, for example, in Mexico, um, they had a sugar tax and it resulted in a small decrease in sugar consumption, but it was nowhere as enough to make sure that obesity would fall um, down down to a healthy level um, or a more acceptable level. And, because, and the thing is, people didn't really, um, it, it was only a slight reduction in sugar consumption, so people didn't really um, stop consuming it much, so, which means people, especially the poor, just ended up paying more to buy the same products they usually buy, um, and that shouldn't have happened. Also, um, so, something worth mentioning is that if, uh, this is a like it's supported by the Greens and a lot of the left. But it's interesting that they're the ones who are against fat shaming and in favour of body positivity. Like saying, yeah. uh, saying you know you shouldn't you know uh, criticise somebody because you know they're they're fat. Yet they're saying uh, saying oh we should we should have this tax. So like f who's like yeah. what's your what's your position? Yeah, it's, it doesn't make sense because this policy is a very good example of fat shaming. I mean, they are fat shaming. They're saying sugar should be re reduced. Um, that's fat shaming. That's what all those inner West hippies are triggered about. You know, they, they're like, it's my body. I choose what I put in it. And the next minute, the Greens start proposing it, which is very, very outlandish. And then all these people are supporting it because, you know, the Greens are supporting it. You know, first, it just shows that those people don't have any... Um, integrity in the first place or any sense of moral reason in the first place and second you know they just dragged on by the greens um to whatever you know they support um meaning they really don't possess any brains at all or they don't possess any, possess any conviction um and yeah you know it's just interesting because you know it's, it's ironic it's ironic because i expect people like sarah hansen young to go off about body shaming and next minute they're all supporting this you know policy that would conform to the definition of body shaming. I think uh, their, their uh, position, like the Greens and the left, is always, uh, if, if it's the government that's doing it, then it's all okay. A private citizen can't do it, but... Yeah, yeah, that's true. It. That's true, yeah. I mean, again, no integrity, you know, no... They're brainless. Um, yeah. And, and it's not as if, like, uh, you know, of... Uh, uh, health, healthy living and uh, ex uh, exercise and diet is like not out of fashion. I mean, it's a huge industry. There's, uh, I mean, there's so many like ads on TV for for weight loss, uh, dieting. Uh, so, so it's not like that. There's some problem that you know, or you know, we don't we don't live in a society where uh, healthy living is is viewed positively.
Exactly. The thing is, those um, health programs and dieting programs, they're very lucrative these days. They're very lucrative. You know, we have people like Magda Shubansky, you know, talking about how she lost weight, weight with, I think it was, was she it put Jenny it, Craig. Yeah, but she put it back on again. <laughs> she did. She did. Um, but she goes on about it. And, you know, it's it's a very lucrative industry these days um, because people are all uh, concerned about their weight. So, yeah, this is, it's, it's a bit like the, um, the, patri the patriarchy argument. You know, they're all going off about how society is still patriarchal, is still sexist. You know, society right now isn't all about, you know, it, it, it's not ignorant to health. We see all these health campaigns everywhere um, by both the government, by schools, and by private businesses, especially by private businesses who are, you know, having all these programs to combat obesity and health problems. Um, so, you know, I think they're just um, building a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly something, the obesity, uh, alleged obesity epidemic, it is, it is something definitely that the market can help solve. And as we're seeing with, oh, uh, I didn't mention the growth of gyms. I mean, I see so many gyms opening up now, the 24-hour fitness uh, places. I mean, there, there is a push to, towards, you know, being healthy, having a, a healthy body. So I definitely think that, you know, we don't need a government to, to introduce a, a destructive solution to it. And let's also remember that... Uh, you know, you do need a certain amount of sugar as well. I mean, it's part oh, of yeah. a uh, part of a a balanced diet. Oh yeah, you do. I mean, you, you do need a certain amount. That's that's a given. Um, you know, and ultimately it leads on to the whole personal responsibility and discipline. You know, that's the solution is you know not to have this regressive sugar tax, which will result in people switching to you know artificial sweeteners. And we all know what artificial sweeteners do. They're harmful to the body, much worse than sugar. They're much more chemical based, they're much more unnatural than sugar. Um, people will switch to that if sugar if a sugar tax is imposed and um, people will switch to alcohol and do you know what that's going to do to people? That's going to be even have an even worse impact. So this program is it's not just about not achieving its goals, it's going to result in people being diverted to even worse options and it's going to make things even worse for society. So I think that's why we need to um, the solution is to feed some sort of discipline and, you know, personal responsibility to the population instead of having this regressive tax. Because, you know, we learn from our mistakes. Humans, if you know, humans do evolve, there's a thing called natural selection because, you know, we learn from our mistakes that so we can't survive. That's how it is. If you, you know, spoil people with these nanny state laws, then you really are going to make society much weaker because humans will become strong only by learning from their mistakes and learning from experience. And this is going to prevent them. This is going to deny them the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and, you know, suffer from their consequences because that's how humans, you know, get better. That's how we live. We survived like that. We, we didn't survive by having all these nanny state laws in the past. We survived by learning from experience. And that's how we will flourish into the future. But if you're going to have all these laws, then you're going to deny humanity a path to keep flourishing into the future. Yeah, exactly right. Now let's move on to another uh, big government measure, which is our lovely left-wing socialist government uh, here in Victoria, led by <laughs> uh, Daniel Andrews. Now, yeah. it's been widely reported that Victoria is in the grips of a crime wave. I mean, there are carjackings, home invasions, uh, violent brawls in the streets, uh, assaults, uh, often by uh, migrant crime gangs. And of course, uh, the solution of Daniel Andrews is not to uh, deploy more actual police, but to deploy the thought police, because the real threat in Victoria is not uh, migrant crime, but it's those evil far-right people who are, you know, uh, just hating hating on uh, pe uh, people of different races for no good reason. So he's announced a series of anti-racism measures, which includes a, a new advertising campaign promoting multiculturalism. Yep, ju just, what, just what we need, more, uh, more government advertising, uh, pushing left-wing ideologies, and also he's going to, we've, we've spoken about the, uh, uh, the Respectful Relationships Program, uh, which is being introduced in Victoria, which is a, a f uh, 
program which teaches feminism, it's now going to be expanded to include uh, racism as well. And there's going to be a crackdown on alleged discrimination in the, the housing market. So if you want a good uh, tenant, if you're a landlord, you could be soon be branded a racist. And also the uh, 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 making sure that police take uh, complaints about racism more seriously. So uh, be careful. You might you might be uh, you might be labelled a racist for no for no good reason. And I mean, this yeah. is just uh, like typical head in the sand stuff that uh, 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 the the Andrews government are trying to deflect the fact that you know there there is a problem with uh, immigration uh, and crime, and uh, they they're just for uh, they're just not addressing it at all. They're just saying, no, it's, it, it, it's not a, an actual problem with migrants and crime. No, it's, it, it's, it's just all made up through this hysteria. I mean, oh, it's, it's unbelievable. It is. I mean, here we have a city, you know, it's meant to be the world's most livable, but then we have Apex Gang, the Apex Gang overrunning, you know, the city is overrun by all these migrants who are criminals like the Apex Gang. And we have, you know, shanty towns like slums in outside major train stations in the CBD. And here is the socialist government led by Comrade Andrews telling people that racism and people's opinions are much more important than focusing on crime and, you know, shanty towns in the city. Are you serious? That's just the most regressive. I swear, I swear this, this is the most brainless, most brainless most incompetent politician I've ever seen. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I've seen left-wing politicians who are regressive, and I've seen left-wing politicians who are socialist, but this is a different level. This is brainless, you know, full stop. And they're spending all this money telling the, telling the police to focus on racism and racism complaints instead of telling the police to focus on Apex members or telling the police to be more um, strong when it comes to handling criminals. Again, a very a very, I, I, I should say, a very feminine, you know, too feminine for, for a government like that. Well, it's much easier for a government to arrest someone for racism than arrest someone someone for violent crime. I mean, so it's, it's picking on an easy target. But it, yeah, it, it doesn't occur to Daniel Andrews that, you know, maybe if you tackled crime, maybe that would reduce some of the, the racial tension in the, yeah. in the community. I mean, people, you know, aren't expressing their concerns about multiculturalism out of thin air. Like they just didn't suddenly wake up one day and say, you know what I really want to do is just hate on like, you know, immigrants for no reason. No, it's because people are seeing what's happening to, to their their communities, how they're becoming more dangerous, and they're saying that it's immigrants who are largely responsible for it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing is, it's just like the response to the Muslim ban, isn't it? I mean, people are trying to tackle Islamic terrorism at its roots, at its roots by banning Muslims, and then you know it's called racism. Same thing here. People aren't focusing on the roots of the problem, and that's the a gangs like Apex. I and mean, Melbourne's always had. Um, you know, criminal gangs who are made up of migrants, but this is different. The Apex gang is something completely different. It's, a, it's at a whole new level. And by ta instead of tackling the issue at its roots, they're tackling people's public opinion um, because it's too offensive and it's too triggering. You know, I don't know. I, I'm scared for, for that. First, I live in New South Wales, so I, I, I'm glad. But, you know, I'm scared for Victoria because, you know, where is, it going to, where, where is it going to go? What's its future if it's going to have this sort of premier leading the state into more degeneracy? And, I, and it's ironic that he made this announcement uh, on the Sunday, the night after there was a massive brawl in Fed Square during yeah. Melbourne's White mm -hmm. Night celebration. Yes. So it's he's completely detached from reality. And he is, yeah. I, it's probably going to take the this uh, Melbourne to be on fire for him to actually wake up. I mean, this is how these uh, left-wing people work. They they just have their head in the sand. They say they come up with excuses. Uh, they they just will not, will not address the, the the real issue. And so the only real uh, so, uh, real solution is uh, next election to turf Daniel Andrews out. It is. Hopefully he does go out because if he stays in, I don't see any future for you know not just for Victoria but for Australia in general because. That ideology spreads quickly. It's like a disease. Um, you know, it's infectious, um, especially for the modern day generations. Um, so, you know, um, I, I, I mean, I understand. I'm not a white person. I get that. People might be asking, I'm not white. Why am I so vocal about all these 
you know, why am I so vocal about multiculturalism? Why am I so against it? Because the thing is, I would understand if you know my original country was overrun with multiculturalism. You know, I would understand if the government there would um, you know reject the traditional ethnic makeup of that country, you know, of India or Sri Lanka, and then you know said, you know what, you know the natives don't have a place here. You know, the foreigners can have an equal place there. I would understand, and I would be angry at that. Same thing here. I understand what people here are going through um, because of all these crazy policies that were started by Go Whitlam or Gough Whitlam, um, and his and his you know stupidity, and you know people are suffering right now because of that. So tackle the problem at its roots, and you know return the country to its actual people instead of telling people what to think. Yeah. Uh, so f- well, th- this is the latest of what Daniel Andrews has done. So we've still got another what, uh, 18 months of this, so God knows what he's going to come up with yeah. next. But um, that's all we've got time for on today's show. So thanks once again, Stukath, for, for joining me. That's okay. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, and of course, uh, I will run through all the uh, reminder announcement. Of course, if you're not signed up to the email list, please do so, so we can keep in contact. It's at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, also consider supporting the work of The Unshackled. You can either become a pat- patron via Patreon or donate via our PayPal. Also, don't forget to uh, subscribe to this podcast, either on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or, of course, view the video version on YouTube. Don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. So thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.